thanks everybody for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a project I set up to help life scientists or generally people who, who do wet work in the laboratory keep better track of their, of their processes and organize their work. And it's called, quite aptly, LabBookDB. So the, the story behind all of this is that if you're familiar with wet work and the life sciences, generally, people tend to have a paper lab book that's basically just a, a binder or, or a booklet. Um, and it's very good because it's a very flexible format. So you can basically write and doodle and put in whatever you want. It has a lot of downsides, though. It's not very portable. You'd have to scan it, send it to people. Uh, manual input only, of course, manual readout only. It's unstructured, meaning that you can't query it in an organized fashion, even if you could read it. Uh, it's quite intransparent, simply because most people yeah, don't have really nice handwriting, and a lot of things are implicit in the structure in which they put inside. So once they go, once they leave the lab, it's very difficult to find out what was written inside, and even they themselves might forget about it over time. It's not very scalable, meaning that if you're working like five years on a project, you're going to end up having a lot of paper, which you'd have to manually query to find out when you did what and in what categories to put things. And I mean, if you're lucky and you're halfway organized, it might look like this. If you're really organized, it might look a bit better. But generally, to be truthful, it looks quite a bit worse. Uh, some people resort to more electronic lab book formats, and they're trying to emulate this like flexibility and free text functionality in a more electronic medium. Uh, that's, of course, nice, because the format continues to be flexible. Uh, you have some limited automatic readout. I mean, you could query the text, but then again, these are mainly proprietary formats, so that's not that easy. Uh, it's not very portable, simply because it might require some proprietary software, which our colleagues might not have or not want to get. Uh, the input is still mainly manual. It's still unstructured. It's still quite untransparent, and it also doesn't really scale well. Instead of having a lot of paper, you just have like a lot of doc files, and this is what that could look like. Um, not that bad, you can put figures inside, but I think it's actually counterproductive to put figures inside because figures, especially as, as uh, raster graphics, can't, can't really be queried nicely for information. Um, some people try to squeeze everything in a table because that's very good for analysis, and uh, that's like going in the right direction, but the problem with the table, right, is uh, that you're not going to be able to put too, too diverse data in it, right? So it's structurable, it's structured. You can read it out automatically. It's very portable, especially if you save it in like comma separated values, but uh, you still have to input stuff manually. It's still quite intransparent simply because your column names can't be that long. Uh, it's not very flexible because you have to stick to this like 2D structure and it also doesn't scale well. You're trying to put all of your details in one and only one table. It's gonna go really, really big. So what some people do, maybe even intuitively, or just to give you an overview over the problems that you get from, from a table. This is like what it would look like if you're trying to put somewhat more complex data in a table, right? And you're noticing that some of these cells have relationships with one another, which this table doesn't really track. So you're going to start to have problems with this simply because all columns apply to all rows, and you're going to have relationships, uh, relationships between columns. And as soon as something, for instance, changes, like maybe if Bob changes his university, uh, you're going to have data duplication. Not only you had that all the entire time, but you might have update irregularity simply because to update his email address, you would have to query all of these like connected related columns, right? Um, furthermore, if you're trying to delete a, a row from this structure simply because, for instance, you realize one operation didn't actually happen, uh, it might have been like a typo when you, when you entered it, you might lose associated data which is contained in the relationships between different columns, yeah? So these are like data, data deletion errors and also data update errors which are very easy to get if you're trying to track related data in a table. And people already intuitively move away from this in that they aptly separate data into tables which query like one concept, which contain one concept, right? So instead of having one table for everything, you might have one table for your operations, one table for details about the operators, one table for the protocols, and so on. This is already going in the right direction, and this is, of course, a very primitive version of a database, simply because it is a collection of tables, but you're not explicitly keeping track of all the relationships and enforcing integrity. Uh, so from here to a database, it's a really, really simple step. That's the first concept of, of LabBookDB, is that 
you have tables where you track like one concept in one table, they're related and that's a database. Of course, the database management system allows you to have links between these tables and in fact, this structure which you've seen here displayed in, in more understandable table format is the same as this, this section of the schema which we track in LabBookDB. So this assigns basically protocols to operations, operations to animals and operators both to the authorship of the protocols and to the operation which was performed on the animals. So you ensure integrity, uh, you maintain an optimally machine readable structure, and you can provide multi-user support. We don't currently do that, but in a database it's easy simply because you just track like the input, uh, the inputs and the queries. Um, it's like one of the core concepts behind LabBookDB and why it enforces you to keep a more orderly set of, data, of metadata which is also less prone to breakage over time. Uh, another concept is that the relational sh schema itself is very valuable. I mean, s you might say, okay, you could store all of this in like a flat file, given that you make it big enough and with like no SQL databases, that's no longer a problem. But the relationships are actually very important. While you might have declarative information stored in the entries, meaning what happened with the animal, you know, the operation, when did what happen, uh, you have a lot of procedural information stored in the relationships, meaning that how to best or optimize perform an experiment is knowledge which is encapsulated in these relationships. Uh, meaning that if somebody new would join the lab, not only would this allow them to understand what was done before, but it would allow them to have like a good structure of how to continue doing this thing given that attributes and relationships are already given by, by people who have performed this sort of measurements over and over and over again. So this is also a section of our schema and it shows here how the treatment protocol is linked to behavioral evaluation. You see that this is quite complicated and it has to be simply because this is a drinking water treatment which is applied per cage, so you have to, in order to assign a mouse to a treatment group, you have to look, was it in the right cage at the time when the treatment happened in that cage? Uh, you do a behavioral measurement, which you film, obviously, because you want to be able to, to prove what happened, and you have multiple evaluations of that film measurement, and then you're trying to match, basically, the treatment group to the evaluation, so you have to transverse the structure. It might seem complicated, but it's, it's an optimal way to do it, simply because somebody who's new to this sort of experiments might think, well, okay, I'm rating the experiment as it happens. But of course, that's a very, that's a very uh, unreliable procedure, simply because you don't have the recourse of the video. So these are things which have already been thought of, and knowledge about how to properly do things has been encapsulated in the schema. Of course, you can do things differently, and that brings us to one of our next points, which is uh, scalability. Let's see, oh, it's not the next one. Yeah, the next point is uh, the fact that interaction structure is more important than hypothesis structure. So this also goes a bit back to these to the way in which you organize the tables. Uh, there are some other database management systems for your lab work. It's just that generally they tend to be very top-down and very hypothesis-based. So you have like a class for an experiment, a class for a hypothesis, stuff like that. Uh, the problem is if you enforce the structure which you intended for your evaluation on the actual storage of the data, you will, uh, you will impede yourself from more freely or more exploratorily organizing the data. We use the term atomization in both the paper and the documentation of the package, and we refer by that to like the smallest feasibly represented entity uh, which interacts with each other. I mean, you do track the cage, you don't track the lid of the cage and the bottom of the cage separately, stuff like that. Uh, it's also important not to track the, not to build your schema around the hypothesis and um, and, pro uh, and projects and experiments simply because plans don't always pan out, right? One example is breeding cages. Some people might, might think that it's a good idea to have like a new class for a breeding cage so that you can store uh, mating events and so on, pups, uh, yeah? But uh, I mean, technically a breeding cage is just a normal cage where a male and one or multiple females uh, cohabit, right? nothing really special happens until a breeding event happens. So ideally, you wouldn't track the hypothesis, well, I'm putting them together in a cage so that they can breed. You just track that you're putting them together in a cage, and if you're lucky and they do breed, then you have a separate class for, for that event. Um, Hypothesis-based organization discourages comparison ac across data sets. For instance, generally, uh, you might want to have control groups if you administer drugs, yeah? So you might have 
have a, a group of mice where you give the drug, another where you give the vehicle. Uh, sometimes they might have to be single cage, so it's not like you're giving to, to different mice in the same cage different substances. Uh, and maybe then you want to do another study where you test another drug, but the vehicle stays the same. So the question would be, okay, do you need a new control group? And the, the answer might be yes or no, but if the answer is no, then it means that something would be different be, between the new control group and the old control group, and that's a detail which you need to keep track of, right? And if you don't test the hypothesis in cases where you can use the old control group, this allows you to have a more free organization of experiments and data analysis. Uh, Hypothesis-based organization, as I said, also discourages exploratory data analysis simply because your data is organized to a couple of questions which you want, according to a couple of questions which you want to ask, not according to what you actually did in the lab, which might include mistakes, which might actually become very relevant markers if you stumble across something new. Uh, actually, that's how very many uh, surprising things were found out. Uh, the thing which I was talking about earlier, the extendable schema, <coughs> which also applies to the situation where, for instance, someone has understood the, the encapsulated knowledge and the schema, but they still want to do it in a different fashion, and that applies quite often in research. You might have a new idea. Uh, and we're trying to address that by keeping this, uh, the schema of, of our database as extendable as possible. And the way we do it is we try to make connections and relationships between tables at, uh, an, as, at as high a level as possible. So we're using join table inheritance to have like base cases. So for instance, one base class, sorry, base class, not base cases, uh, for measurements, which contains the attributes, which are common to all measurements, like the fact that each measurement has a date. Uh, and then we have different polymorphic classes, like different, uh, different de uh, derivative classes built on top of that, which can be linked via a key, which is stored on the measurement table to an animal, meaning that each animal has a measurement attribute, but inside that attribute you might have any number of classes derived from the base measurements class. This allows you, if you have like a completely new kind of measurement with a completely new set of attributes, to just plug it in and edit that without damaging the integrity of the database and without having to reshuffle too many objects. So we try to do that as much as possible. It could also, also be done with the animals. So right now all of our subjects are animals simply because we do animal research. But technically you could have a meta class with a subject and you have animals, you might have plants, you might have humans. So things which, which tend to have quite different attributes from one another. Uh, this one way in which we keep the database extendable. Uh, we also use input tracking, both to keep our code robust to like, uh, to, to keep our database robust to like big updates in the schema. So if you do change something which, which would no longer be backwards compatible, it's good to have the data in such a fashion where you can like simply regenerate your database. Also, it provides proof of, uh, of discovery or, or of observation simply because it is tracked via Git. So unless you like de delete the repository or pull it down, you will be able to see when what was edited. It's also a lot better to track text files. So here we track the Python code, which generates the database via our lab book database library uh, instead of the database itself, which is in binary format. You might also think that you could track the, um, like the data dump from the database, which you can also get in text format. Uh, but doing that would mean that you're concomitantly tracking the input data and the version of the database library with which you have compiled your database. So we'd like to keep those two things separate. Um, the syntax, I mean, if you're good in Python, it's, it's not that difficult. We even set up like uh, an abbreviated syntax to signal, uh, like to identify linked uh, like related entries. If you're not very good in Python, this becomes difficult. So one thing we're looking at is having nicer output formats. Like for instance, uh, spreadsheets. Lots of biologists like to use spreadsheets when they're in the lab with a piece of paper. Sometimes also if you're working like in a super sterile lab, it's not a good idea to take your laptop inside unless you want to bathe it in ethanol before and after. Uh, so so um, yeah, a spreadsheet format which could then be read and inputted automatically into the into the database would be would be a nice thing to have, but we're we're still getting there. Um, another capability which we have is plotting. We have a lot of ways to query specific data and to pipe it to a plot, plotting library, which used to be part of LabBookDB, but we've branched it simply to allow people to plot even if they don't use our, our database. So this is a timetable plot where you basically have a section of the lifetime course of the animals, and you can highlight via dictionary input uh, what kind of events you want and with which colors and with what kind of dots on it. We use Matplotlib as a backend. It's actually quite nifty. So here you see a longitudinal drug 
drug treatment of animals where you have the, the fMRI measurement is shaded and different behavioral tests with, with dots on them. So this is quite cool to keep an overview. Uh, we also have like analysis for the actual data itself. So for instance, this is the four swim test. Uh, the, the somewhat larger schema uh, section, which I showed you beforehand, serves to, to query the data which is required for this. It matches treatment groups to different evaluations of the force swim test, and it can bin evaluations of the force swim test over time intervals and create this graph. Uh, so here you see, for instance, that animals which have received fluoxetine are a bit more uh, immobile than animals which haven't, which you, you wouldn't really expect, so it might be a fluke. But anyway, this, this demonstrates like the plotting capabilities. All of these plots are like triggered with, with one single line of Python. So we have for uh, established use cases, we already have the entire querying, uh, querying and input set up so that it's easy. And as I said, due to the extendability of the database, we hope to make it easy for, for new kinds of research as well. Uh, one thing which is very, very good is the command line reporting. So via, via like a simple command, you can, um, you can pull out information in a very easily readable text form, which you can view on your headless server, on your laptop, on whatever, about what happened to the animal. So I don't know if you can read this, but here you can see in what cages the animal was starting at what dates, whether it's a male or a female, how it's tagged, what measurements we have done with it, if, you ha if it has any treatments, the fact that it's had two operations performed on it, so all of this can be queried very, very easily. Generally, if you're using a traditional lab book, if you want to find this out, it's going to be a lot of work. And generally, to assign treatment groups and divide analysis at the end, you want to do something like this. So very many of my colleagues have the issue that they would like to pool all of their data over years and years of work, but that's, that's just infeasible simply because they would have to dig through so much information, which might be quite difficult to understand. Uh, so having said that, and having a bit of time left, I'd like to give you a short demo of how this can work. So I've set up, you can see the link here, I've set up a repository which contains example Python uh, database uh, source code, and it can generate a database. So basically, if you're looking to generate your own database with LabBook DB, you can do the following. Oh my, it opened in the right display. So you can go to, where was it, SRC, demo log, where I clone this, you can clone it on your own computer. You could actually try it now, but the problem is you might not have uh, SQL Alchemy and some of the other dependencies installed. Uh, but you, uh, you can see what it looks like right here. Uh, we have like different modules for how, for how you might want to, um, to generate your data. Right now we just have this from Python code module. So going inside, I can just type Python, generate DB, and it starts. And here it gives test feedback when it introduces each entry inside. And uh, to print something which you can understand, it uses the string attribute, the, the str attribute of each object. Uh, it takes quite a bit, which is one of the other things we're struggling with, simply because as the database grows, like this is already quite a big database, but on my laptop it takes about 30 seconds to generate, uh, which uh, is not a problem at this time, but if we continue growing it, if we keep regenerating it, uh, it might be difficult. So we might be looking, okay, this was a bit faster. Actually, anyway, uh, and now you have this, uh, it, you should have a meta.db file, which is the database. You can copy it in, in whatever canonical destination you prefer to have on your computer. I use sync data simply because I sync it across all of my systems. Uh, meta.db, whoop. Great, and now based on this, you can, for instance, query it. So to give you the example before, we use a meta command just like git does, simply so that we don't crowd the uh, the um, namespace for executable, so it's LDB in capitals, and uh, you have a couple of um, subcommands for it. You can like actually have a look at what it gives us. I keep getting those uh, those error messages from IPython, but it's uh, it's not something which uh, which uh, disturbs the functioning of the of the program. So you can you have like the add generic if you want to add information from the command line, animal info which if you want to query some basic info from the from the command line. Uh, animals ID, if you just want a big table with all of the IDs of the animals. Animals info, if you want a big table with a lot of details on each animal. A pan parameter, if you want to uh, adjust one attribute of something which is already in the database. Cage info, if you want to find out what, what's happening in one of the cages. And further cages, we use this all the time. We import animals, and you want to know, okay, what's like the, the next number of a free cage which I can put on it. It's actually very simple, but also very nifty. So 
let's see if I already have this. Okay, animal info. This is the subcommand minus p. This gives you the path to the uh, to the database file. This gives you the identifier, and here you have like the the how do you call it? The institution for which to use that identifier. If you don't put an institution inside, it just queries like the ID. Um, row on the table, but here we have like the animals which we keep at the ETH and Zurich, and they have like their own numbering system. So for instance, this would be animal 5682. And pressing on enter, we'll get the errors from IPython, but we'll also get like all of the nice, uh, all of the nice details. So we have the license number, we have the birth date, we have the death date, this animal is already dead. Uh, we have the IDs which it had in different databases, what genotype it had, it can have multiple genotypes of course, in what cages it stayed when, uh, the fact that we've injected virus in it when it, we've implanted an optic fiber and at what dates we've done so, and plenty of measurements and how much it weighed at each measurement time point. Um, so these are like the, the features which actually for us make a lot of work easier and I hope that this is uh, quite easy. Like in, in my experience with collaborators, it's not that hard to get it work on more, more use cases. So if any of you have similar issues or something which you'd like to track in a lab book database, I'd be really happy to see if I can help you, help you address them simply because as we grow our database, it also becomes easier for us to more spontaneously include whatever experiments inside and broaden our analysis. So I think this is like a really nice win-win scenario. Without further ado, I'd like to say that I'm very happy I finished early and I'd like to take questions from you. It's okay. Go. The plotting interactive, what do you mean by that? Yeah. And it was nice to show you all of those, uh, all those little uh, mice basically in their, in their pages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to hover over those and see some of the information that you just pulled out, um, basically just on hover and basically say like, oh, this mouse was like going yeah, through yeah. this. I think, I think it's an interesting question, especially like generally from the plotting point of view, like do you want interactive plots? And my personal response to that is no way, simply because I want to make sure that when I show people the plots, everybody sees the same thing independently of whether they're querying something or not. So if you want to see other details, you would start another plot. Having said that, it's free and open source, and if you like it and you'd like to contribute that and doesn't break anything else, I'd be very, very happy to offer this feature to people who think they need it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I do a lot of field work, um, and I have a whole room full of paper field sheets, and I still take paper field sheets even though I, I do uh, Python, and, and uh, paper actually solves other problems, not just the flexibility. Uh, so I use the example to see how to work fix something so that often I have to go to a sheet that's 20 years old and there's multiple changes that we need to track what the original value was then what the change value is and then who did that change and that's required for, for court cases um, so is there some sort of type of facility in that in your package that can allow for that I'm, I'm familiar with the issue and of course a number of people brought it up. Uh, brought it up. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in very, very many cases this is a very theoretical issue, uh, meaning that it almost never happens, but for cases where it does, what I think would be very well suited to address that is the tracking of the input code via Git. Simply if you would check, uh, if you would store incrementally the checksums or the entire repository somewhere which is like not under your direct control, you could guarantee that you can go back with Git and prove the the authorship and the exact date when that happened. So I think that would be the best way to address that issue with our structure. Uh, but maybe one thing is that for you, your field sheets are first class objects, physical pieces of paper that are evidence. Right, exactly. So and then those are of the same category of objects as physical mice. Uh, the database is not replacing the sheets any more than the database is replacing the mice. The database is Have other, we have databases that have the data in it, but we have to go back and and it, it's, it would be very difficult to recheck. You know, every time you make a change, to make another data a GitHub object for that entire database, because you really want to look at the one object, the one data mm -hmm. object, and see what the change is just on the one piece, and then know also who did it, because these people either are employed or some of them are even dead because this has been been so long. Um, 
Yeah. Those are the challenges that we have. That includes one of the main reasons that we have paper and don't go in the field and actually just use a computer. Because we could take a computer, type the information in, but so we use, we actually use paper. For this day. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we, we don't track the database itself in Git. We track the input code. This, this easy is like, it, it doesn't grow over time as fast as it would if you would update the database, which is binary in Git on, on every single addition which you make to the code. It also allows you to see what exactly you edited. Uh, but to get back to your like legal framework question, of course the law is, is not under, under our control. So the, the adaptation to allow something like this to be used in court cases would have to come from the courts, right? My point is that I I believe Git could serve to address that issue if, if legislators would be interested in something like that. Yeah. Definitely. So I mean, there's there's a fair amount of work in into designing a good um, schema which encapsulates the procedural knowledge of your field. Like I mean, you you have to be good in your field and to talk to other people who are good in your field to set up a smart schema. So that took a while, but I I don't think it's infeasible. I mean, I've this is not my main research project, and I was able to do something which addresses arc use cases very very well. So I'd assume that you would be able to do the same. Exactly, exactly. Also, the way we package this right now is as a, uh, as a personal database um, application, meaning that you have it on SQLite and you run it on your own computer locally, which of course doesn't scale that nicely if you want to force it down everybody's throat on your institute, but that's not what we think is a good strategy for expansion, simply because this structure gives any researcher autonomy to like just fork it and use it locally for his own work. Like you don't need a huge institutional commitment, you don't need an, an SQL, like a real SQL server with user logins and everything you can like just fork it and provided that you have the dependencies you're you're good to go and that, that the schema applies to your field but if you'd be interested to set up a schema for your field I could share with you like in more detail the challenges which I've gone through which were interesting but not uh, prohibitive and I'm, I'm sure you would be good to go yeah mm-hmm I've been actually thinking about graph databases and whether or not that's a good idea. Uh, my, my present take on that was that SQL is just much more established and there's much more support to be had, especially in a new project. Uh, currently we're using SQL Alchemy as like, the, like we don't use SQL directly, we use it from Python. So we have like Python classes to track, to track our objects and our tables. Um, SQL Alchemy doesn't allow you to use uh, graph databases on the back end yet. I, I don't know if they might be interested in including that at any point. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Definitely. That, that need not be the case. Like currently, I maintain the database for myself and collaborators, yeah. But supposing you have a lab and you have mm -hmm. five people working on yeah. um, and they're doing experiments on different things. Yeah. Does this facilitate any of that? Or is it like you have to share a file and then they have to make comments or you share the same repository? So you could switch the backend to something more uh, more multi-user friendly, where you can do where you can do the user thing in SQL Alchemy. What you, what you could also do, although it's a bit of a hack, but I think it's cooler simply because you, it allows you to keep track of the user interaction over Git. You just have multiple people access the Git repository, which generates the database. It would be a bit of like uh, solving the same problem around SQL, but I think it actually has its advantages. Yeah. Okay, so thanks very much, everybody.